until I mean I always remember but I usually remember five minutes late all right well it's nine o'clock so we'll just get started as we normally do welcome to uh the our uh bi-weekly soon to become weekly again virtual interim meeting um our my co-chair Alan has unexpectedly had to board a plane today so he will not be with us but he should be resuming uh next week uh let's see so uh, as always this is the note well it concerns intellectual property implications of you being here as well as our code of conduct if you've not seen it before please take a look at it you can you can find this in your search engine um as always we'll be using zulip for chat functions uh i put a link to zulip in the uh, google it's a pinned message in the google meet chat if you're having trouble finding it similarly in the google meet chat there's a pinned note with a link to the the notes um please go sign the blue sheet um go over there and just do that now just add yourself to the numbered list um for queuing we're going to do the show we're just for any sort of hand raising thing like entering a queue or whatever we're just gonna use google me um so chat and note taking and blue sheets are the only functions that are not in google meet for this meeting all right, our agenda is pretty much what it all is always is modulo uh, specific issues, but Ian's going to talk about some PRs. Um, we've discussed uh, so I, th I the chairs and Ian agreed that that he was going to publish a new version of the MOQT draft this afternoon. I mean, it, perhaps if they're like extreme extenuating circumstances, we might delay it till tomorrow. <laughs> like I if mean, there's something if there's something that needs to be resolved, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the anyway. intent. Can we just take a couple. Can we kind of agenda bash then to just have a couple minutes on consensus around the Peeps ID, basically? <laughs> Before we, if we're going to Peeps pop, name, the Peeps name. Okay, so I think we're more. Yeah, let's just put that. All right. Yeah. Part. Okay. I, uh, I, I, <laughs> I'm on record as not wanting to spend a ton of agenda time that, but I'm happy. Uh, to I know that. I got, I got your point, Martin. I just want so, to. So, 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 so yeah. I'll, I'll happily insert a couple of minutes once I get through these slides. Yeah. Uh, okay. We need to scribe. As always. Be a short meeting if you don't describe. I mean, I, I can scribe. Sorry. Thank you, Mike. Lovely. All right. Well, that is it for that. So let's take. I'm going to time box this to about three minutes. But um, uh, Colin, what's your issue? So Martin, look, of all people in the world, I don't need to explain to you how consensus works. But I don't think we have consensus on the name, and the name doesn't normally matter. I agree. But in this ma time, it matters because we can't really agree on what the scope or use case of this is to a certain degree. So I think if we don't have consensus, we should not be merging this to the working group draft. That's how it works. Now, I think we could get consensus for it in two minutes on it seemed to me that subgroup more or less had consensus. It's just you didn't like it. I didn't like it. That's why that was my read of the tea leaves. But oh, I, I'm, like, if okay. everyone likes that as a name, we're done, right? <laughs> okay. Does anyone object to subgroups as a name? <laughs> Speak now or forever hold your peace. Or, or offer a bet, Mike, if you got a better idea, like like bring it on. Like, like Okay, well, I mean, there were a lot. I mean, that was the problem with too many ideas. Like, I mean, <laughs> I thought, oh, we'll quickly find a name, but then everyone decided to propose like 10 different proposals that were slightly different, and no one commented on anyone else's proposals. They had their own proposal, so it seemed like I, a thing. I, I can add like one second flavor of uh, like five seconds flavor. Like, the only reason why I proposed subgroup is for only one reason because we thought that there was very uh, there was a ambiguity in thinking this applies to the entire track, and, and it was very hard to convince people saying that the use case is not to replay uh, to kind of you know or peep doesn't mean the entire track it's something a part of the group, um, and and it, it made it at least semantics very clear for explaining to people that's the only reason peep does not give that clarification, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, uh, so. Um... I mean, as an editorial matter, like it does have obviousness going for it. Yeah. 
Okay. I, I don't. I don't hear anyone that is going to. I, I, no one's expressed any problem with this, so like it's so ordered. I'll send a brief email to the list, um, and uh, maybe maybe we can do that finder place before we ship. Sure. And like, yeah. look, if we're, if we're on that path, I don't really have an objection to this or whatever. But I I just I you know I also like don't think it's fair for the chairs to be like, look, somebody else has to go get consensus on this. No, you as author of this PR have to get consensus around your PR. For well, it to go so, into the working group document, that's just how it works, and you know well, that. Well, we see our, we, so we all we all merge it with the understanding it was going to be a placeholder. I, like I don't I don't think I, 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 I don't I don't I don't I don't resent like I I don't regret like merging it as is, uh, okay. because this could have been a very painful process. Um, like I I also don't think that well I mean I think there was a there was general consensus we would not ship an RSC with the word peeps in it. I was there was a rough consensus of that. But I, I like I don't think we could say this is an urgent problem to fix in the draft. But if it's easy and it turned out to be easy, uh, then there's no issue there. Okay, let's move on. Ian, oh, one thing. Um, Victor raised his hand, and also um, is going to is someone else going to write a PR for that, or do you want me to write a PR for that? I just need to know who's doing the work before. If we're going to try to get this done before late today, tomorrow morning, someone needs to tell me what's happening. Uh. It's easy enough. I'll do it. Okay, perfect, Victor. As somebody who complained, I don't mind people assigning me work, but I have this other PR going on right now too. <laughs> yeah. I, as, oh, as usual, I wanted to watch my objection to the notion that everything that's currently in the working group draft has consensus, because we merged a lot of things with notions that we will reconsider them, uh, and I'm a bit concerned if we. And the reason we do that is otherwise we would make zero progress whatsoever. Uh, because uh, if we insist on everything having like 100% consensus and we will not revisit, we will not make any progress. And that's the state we were like a year ago. I, I hear you, Victor. I think we should clearly, I think stuff that we does not have consensus, probably our best path forward is to mark it as not having consensus. But I mean, you know. We are working in an ITF process here. Okay, moving on, Ian. Okay, great. Uh, Cullen, uh, have you reviewed, I'd like to start with Cullen's PR, which is 525, I will put it in the chat. Um, it clarifies subscribe and announce. I think it's heading in a lot of the right directions. Um, I'm not sure if there's, I don't know if this is just a case of like some editorializing. Um, there were some longer comments from Alan and Cullen in particular, although Alan's not here, but he was largely positive anyway. Um, I mean, from my perspective, it was certainly, it made it clear at least what one could do uh, with these interactions. So whether or not it's perfect, I don't know, but it's at least an approach which we did not have written down previously. Um, Juan, would you like to make any yeah. other comments? Or? I, I mean, I, like most of the comments that I, I mean, it just, I mean, I'm on the same page as, as Ian here. I mean, I think most of the, I mean, there's a bunch of things that need clearly need to be fixed up in it. Um, and some small things. I think the, the, Two the the two really relevant things that I think I'd like to talk about before we decide what to do with this or we really get input on this group call with us. One, the authentication part, I would like to just ignore, more or less ignore that for now. I mean, my view on this has always been authentication here will be modeled after how authentication works in CDNs today, um, probably with some extra tweaks because our stuff is always a little bit more complicated, but like that that's a whole topic in itself that spans across the whole thing. So I'd like to just sort of not worry about trying to resolve the CD, the authorization comments in the, in this particular PR. So that's one thing I'm hoping to get, you know, feedback. If that's all right with people, then I'm just going to defer those comments to later. Um, is that generally people, Ian gave me a thumbs up, other people thumbs up on that? There, there may be time to discover or to discuss auth at the uh, hybrid interim for yeah. folks who are interested in it. Um, it's on the like potential list, but yeah. 
Okay. So, so the second one that is really, uh, I think, key normative and behavior here that's that we really need to like that, you know, it's a meaty topic that we need to make sure we're all on the same page of. And this is about handling of duplicate objects. And I said that it, and by relays, really, I mean, what in subscribers do with a duplicate object is like I, they can do whatever they want with it. That's up to them. But for relays, when they're deciding what to do with it, we need to talk about that a little bit. So I had there um, the the duplicate, the second object when it arrives, the duplicate is an oh, okay. So let me define what a duplicate is first for everyone. It's like, you know, same full track name, same group ID, same object ID. You get a second copy of the data. What do you do with this, right? Um, and there's, I mean, the first reaction lots of people have happened is let, let's define this so you never get duplicate. Let's make it so it's impossible to receive duplicate objects, but it's impossible to do that. You have situations where you dropped an object into a quick stream, the quick stream died. You don't know whether. You have to resend it. You don't know whether it was re ever sent or not. There will be cases in failover edge cases where you get a duplicate object. They'll be rare, but relays will get them. So I had proposed that the relays just discard the second copy of the object. And I think this was a bad, this is a bad suggestion on my part. I, I think like Ian's like, you know, caches do get corrupt. That's a fact of life. And I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, every cache I've ever seen, you need to have a way to fix it when it gets corrupt, right? Um, so the fact we have, caches in the relays, I think means that we should go with the, you know, the latest, that when you get a duplicate object, it overwrites the old object in the cache. Um, now, I, that, that makes, that's, that's what makes sense to me. Um, but I do think that we come up with the question of, well, then do we forward it? And I think the answer that I have is like, if we already forwarded something, we probably shouldn't forward it because otherwise you can get these cache storms of things trying to update each other. That basically just if a relay gets it, it, it should update its own cache, but probably shouldn't forward it. Um, that might complicate other problems. And again, I'm not talking about the cache to cache protocol or the relay to relay protocol. The relay to relay protocol is out of scope of it and how the relays figure out whether they forward to other relays and how they distribute data. I don't really care. But from a meta point of view, I would think the relay network would, when it got an updated copy, send it down. So let me shut up for a second there. Other people want to comment on this, input thoughts? What should we do on this, this question? Um, on a high level, I think the things you proposed just now are implementable and straightforward. Um, okay. And so that's good. Okay, so look, short of any other guidance, I'm going to I'm going to update the text in the PR then to say that it um, replaces that, that when you get a duplicate object, it replaces the previous object in the cache. Obviously, somebody who fetched it or later subscribed or resubscribed a second time or anything like that would get the copy that was in the cache, which is a newer copy. Um, but that if you already forwarded the object to somebody who had a subscription, it's not like you need to be like, oh, whoops, I've got an updated thing in my cache, figure out that it was different than the previous one and then decide to forward it. That just sounds hard to implement. Um, so I'll, I'll update it along those lines. Um, those were the two major ones I saw. I guess we could just go through top to bottom on sort of the comments that we'd received and see if it, or but actually let, let's do this the other way. A bunch of the people, uh, Alan's on the call, but a bunch of, you know, people who made comments, is there another, is there other parts of this graph you'd like to see changed? Uh, or PR you'd like to see changed that we should talk about? And we could just go through top to bottom and look at them too, if people want. It, I mean, for me, the only thing was like, I thought the must should be a should because servers slash relay is going to do what servers slash relay is going to do. I agree. I'm I'm going to commit your suggestion oh, okay. now. Besides that, I had no other normative comments that were relevant. Yeah, yeah. No, I I totally agree with you. I, I, that was a must in the sense. I wish you must, but I know you won't. I really wish you oughta. Yeah, exactly. Um, is it Suas and then Mo in the queue or? Yeah. Um. I I can go first. Um. I I, I think. Uh, just on the PR, this clarifies quite a bit of uh, make before use case that I'm thinking and so helps. Thanks for the PR. And sec second thing is that the only comment I had was exactly what Ian said on the must versus should. Um, if you can fix that one, I think it should be good. Yeah. 
I think Mo, you're up. Sorry, um, Jimmy Ellis was on mute. Um, yeah, I think it's a great pair. Brings out a lot of important things. Let's make sure we schedule the authorization and authentication discussion. Um, I don't know if we're going to try to do some of that during the interim or if we're going to make that a focus of some other side meeting. But I think that's an important topic, um, and I agree it shouldn't be lumped in with merging this, but it's an important topic and it, it, it trumps most of the changes that um, that were made. Um, on the last the last uh, point of pivoting towards requiring, or at least as a should, that relays will overwrite their cash. I'm a little nervous about that because it almost codifies a way to update comp content that we claim is immutable. You know, having it normative that you must replace your immutable content <laughs> is a strange normative uh, requirement. Um, and it gets even uglier if we if we try to go down the road of well you have to compare them and if they're different then you do this if they're the same then you, you know um, I, I think it, it's it's bizarre to claim that they're immutable but then yet require the relays to allow updates. So Mo, would you prefer to be undefined behavior, thus making it very risky to to? I mean, I think I can live with yes. that as an individual. Uh, I, I think undefined behavior is actually better because then people can't people can't um, you know rest on the fact that oh your the RFC says that you should be doing this your relay is broken. Um, I don't think that's a property that we want in the relays in general. Whatever's easiest for them to dedupe, they should do. So it's not much should it's the May then. I, I think, Mo, you make a really good point that uh, <laughs> also, I think also like now that I think about abuse, I don't know how this could be abused, but like, what if you got, you know, an auth token that you stole and then now you can replace all the content in the caches or something like that? Like, maybe, I don't know. My first thought was right. legitimate abuse. Cash poisoning is the flip side of this, right? <laughs> my, my first thought was legitimate abuse. That if your build on objects forwarded, oh, I'll just publish the same object a thousand times and just update it. And my bill from Akamai is zero. Uh, legitimate abuse. Licensed abuse. That's By the stick. I think um, maybe, maybe couldn't we all agree that like, I think what Colin said earlier, which is true, which is like, if you get another copy of it, whether or not it differs and whether or not you decide like which one to cache, you don't re forward it if you've already sent it once. I think that's probably a property I think we can all agree on. And that probably seems important from like a billing perspective, from like a, I, I think we're just going to cause ourselves like insanity if we start doing anything else but does that make sense yeah. but yeah mo you're making total sense uh i'm not sure yeah <laughs> okay so not forward for sure but then in uh, so our options are on when you get the duplicate object and talking about the cache we can you know must ignore must replace or undefined. That's our three choices, right? So um, I, I think may replace. May replace. I think that's fine. I mean, if you know your infrastructure and you trust it or something, then you're probably going to replace it because it's, you know, right. it, it, I think this is very deployment specific to me, but maybe, you know. And that also meets most requirement of being undefined in a certain way. Because you never know what a relay is doing. <laughs> yeah. I I do think that different circumstances will matter. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think um, there's going to be some circumstance in which we have to like um, the cache is going to be corrupted for reasons that are application, et cetera, related based on my HP experience. Um, and so probably you know, different ZN networks will have a mechanism for like basically refreshing slash purging the cache in such a circumstance. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think 
I don't think it matters too much what we write here, but May seems fine just because, yeah, I mean, the, the things will come up like, oh, you know, I found out this was corrupt. I need to update it or, but, you know, but we should not set up, a, but I think having must replace sets up a situation, as, as Mo said, where you can, like producers could just force caches to do things that they shouldn't be forced to do. And, or we'll assume the caches will do things that they shouldn't necessarily do. So I think that's, I think, I think we're, I think we're converging. Okay, I think I know how to fix this now uh, then. Um, um, I will work on that later today. Um, I'll just make a note to myself here. Um, other ones? I think that might be it, but I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, Ellen may never have wrote the comments, but like, I mean, certainly I didn't notice anything that was obviously like insane. It was, it was very much in the shape of what we discussed before. So, um, and it, yeah, it closes out a number of issues we've wanted to close out for a while. Yeah, it just does close a bunch. Okay. Um, I don't, I mean, I think this is uh, between Ian and I, we can tweak this up and Ian can decide when it's ready to merge. But I think we're, we're good. Does that sound right to people? So, yeah. I'm reading it now for the first time, but um, I don't see huge. I, I've got some tweaks, but like, I don't think they're major. If they turn out to be major, then we can deal. Yeah. Okay. Sounds great. Um, if, and unless anyone objects, then I will move on. Uh, the oh, although I do want to um, pause for a moment. At the moment, I think on the interim on the ver uh, hybrid interim schedule, um, auth is mentioned as a potential thing we could discuss. If we want to have a productive discussion about that in Cambridge, it would probably be helpful for people who know more about auth than I do to prepare slides or some sort of material. Um, I'm not guaranteeing, I mean, I'm not sure anyway, but like, I'm not guaranteeing we'll have time for that, but it seems, I mean, I think we will have time for at least one of the uh, parking lot, et cetera, topics. And so like, if people think that auth is the most important of those, then um, having something prepared would be helpful. I think the priorities uh, that, um... I think the priorities we're setting for the interim are number one, fetch. Number two, this publish priority thing, like this this combination of surprise at what this spec currently says and and like implementation experience, uh, and just uh, Victor's issue basically, and then and maybe auth is a third thing, uh, assuming that this other stuff lands before that. Yeah. It, I I don't have enough knowledge of auth unfortunately to make good slides. So, like, yeah. if anyone else in the working group is willing, that would be really helpful. I think one thing that might be helpful, even if we not discuss the solution, uh, gather the requirements as part of the interim, what kind of auth uh, solutions that you, like, what's the requirement you want to address, that would be good for next uh, meeting to come up with proposals. To yeah, address. like, it, 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 it is. Already it, do, whether that's broken or works well. Yeah. An introduction to auth, like, on Thursday morning or something, so we can talk about it at lunch and sort of get some common understanding might be worth like an hour of time if it's time boxed. Uh, but let me talk to my co-chair about that. I do want also, uh, while we're on the topic of Boston, like this this whole, like the whole fetch thing, uh, Alan asked a very specific question uh, over there, which was like, do we agree that this is kind of the, the use case list for fetch or the, the list of, excuse me, the, the problem statement for fetch? And uh, there were a bunch of responses to like, I would like to make a proposal, which is uh, like, which is great. Like, you know, we're gonna have time for proposals in, in Cambridge. It's not actually what he asked. So like the, the, the immediate proximate problem is to agree what the problem is that we are solving. And so like, please, I, I, would, I, would, I would ask everyone to please respond to that 
note in that his e- I think it was an email in that spirit first, and then we can, and then we're happy to solicit proposals or t- you know requests for time in 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 Cambridge to 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 pitch proposals. That's fine, but like let's first agree on the problem we are solving here. We're never going to get anywhere. End of end of PSA. Uh, next issue, uh, were you? Yes. Um, Mike wrote a very small PR, which I will present because it's so small that I can. I was going to merge it earlier, but I figured I would uh, give everyone the opportunity to take a look. 529 um, adds three errors. Uh, but, 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 let me see if I can find that PR. Sorry, what does timeout signify? Nothing arrived in some amount of time. That was a question I had. Um, Mike, do you know? I mean, this was mentioned on the issue by Ellen. So, is it Ellen who brought that up? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no. I just transcribed from the original issue. Yeah. The yeah. I mean. Okay. I guess I could click through. I mean, today we do not have explanations of why you would do any of the error codes unless they're mentioned kind of normatively or otherwise in the text. Um, well, I mean, most of them are pretty. Well, Crack does not exist is quite straightforward. Yeah. That's quite a reasonable one. Unauthorized is also quite straightforward. Um, yeah, the timeout, I'm not sure about, but yeah. Colin. Uh, I My vague recollection of the timeout, and Alan may have meant something different, was you have a case where uh, a client sends a subscribe to a relay the relay sends that upstream and never hears anything back, right? And sooner or later, the relay needs to clean up that state and get rid of it. Um, and I suspect that that's the use case of what's, what's well, look, we need an error for that case, no matter what you call it. I don't know if that's timeout or something yeah. different, but I think that that was what was, what was meant by timeout. Yep. Uh, so maybe, um, uh, so, maybe in the relay handling section on subscribes, we need a little bit of text somewhere that says when you generate this timeout behavior, if, if it's what I just described yeah. um, in this PR, but I'm like, I'm all thumbs up on this PR uh, <laughs> regardless of. <laughs> yep. Yep. Sure. Uh, so you had your hand up for a moment? No, I, I think um, I, I, I kind, of, kind of summarized yeah. what I wanted to say, but we the, the thing that I was missing is that uh, or text that explains what timeout is. So, some, some not, even if it's not normative, that's fine. But um, that may not be in this PR. But some we need to have an issue on. We need to have an issue on that one. Yeah, I, I kind of agree. I mean, I think it would be helpful to yeah. have more text about this. Um, okay, so I'm going to merge this PR, and then as a follow up, if someone wants to file an issue about like writing more text, or if someone just wants to write a PR that like describes like better how we expect these to be used, um, that would always be welcome. At some point, we will have text about every single error code and why you use it and when you must use it and when you may use it and all those things. We are not quite there yet. Um, and so at this point, I'm fine for it just existing and we'll move on, if that makes sense. So, but um, but thanks for the PR. So, yeah. Merging. Um, Oh, uh, I think, yeah, and the last one is this one. And I think, um, so this is adding a header length for parsing. Uh, so, do you want to give a quick explanation or? Yeah, sure. Like, uh, the, the, the main issue was the trial power parsing might. Um, I might have its own uh, kind of forms that might might not not work as expected many times. And the issue was raised a while back, and we wanted to kind of address. I went basically you can think that I went to the extreme version of it, which might not be what we want. But the idea here is to for the control messages, instead of main, uh, the the thing is that every control message will have a uh, head uh, header length and then the body of the control message. 
but also data and also data messages that we have data messages in two forms right one is self contained like an object datagram where probably we don't need anything to say versus something like um um like where we have a header a track the header header uh, and then followed by a lot of objects that follows that one so this this, this uh, pr also adds to that header a length of that and also for the data it also adds a length to that i think the main cons Questions have fallen into the category that like control having the header is good, uh, then length header. But for the actual data, do we need, really need the length or not? I'm okay either way. I uh, just want to kind of get in consensus on one way versus the other. And the, that's exactly the discussion I wanted to have is because um, I or you or whoever could, yeah, mm -hmm. craft a smaller PR to make it only control messages. Um, I, I think control messages. I mean, that's TLB, like, it seems like a standard approach. Um, the other ones I'm less sure of, but uh, if people can provide their thoughts, that'd be great. Well, one, one, no, just I'd like to add one point is that the, the object messages for the payload, we do have the payload length. So it's not that it's not totally trial parsing there, but the things that come before the payload is not, we don't have how much, don't know how much it is, and they're not many either. So keeping that in mind, please, provide your inputs. I, I no. will note that fixing the doing this only for control messages right now doesn't stop us from doing it for data messages later if we decided that was the right thing or whatever. So I mean, like it seems like a let's do the part we know now. Uh, cool. Uh, Mo. Yeah, I, I think uh, the way it's it's defined here is the right way to do it. It's just uh, you know having having the um, control messages have the our b nomenclature for you know uh prefixed length prefixed uh blob makes sense but we need to be careful because um that spans the entire control message right not just um not just some parts of it if, if the control message has an extensible um tlv thing that includes that extensible TLV thing, right? Like the setup parameters. And if we had parameters to any other message, or if we had yeah. not parameters, but some other TLV thing, like we're doing to the object messages themselves, we're adding TLV things to the object messages too, right? So this always encompasses all of that, but not the type. Yes. Okay. Well, the, by notion of the B, that means that it includes some uh, length and set of bytes. So that bytes includes the entire message. Yeah. Um. I. Yeah. So, so I'm not, yeah. I, I, I don't. That's me. I don't. I don't strenuously object to this, but I. I, I do think this is trading off. I mean, this seems like a straight trade off of gaining CPU efficiency at the cost of wire efficiency, and like my. My like transport guy instinct is to not do that, <laughs> but um, I, I'm not convinced this is an actual DOS vector. And I mean, even Christian's original um, like issue was like this may be a mild DOS vector. Uh, I, I would not do this. I think if it were just up to me as an individual, but uh, I'm not gonna. I don't think this is a huge problem way or the other. I have a question for the working group or for the folks who are on the call at the very least. Um, what will happen if you get a control message you do not understand? Because I think to me, that's a key question here is if you get a message type you do not understand, are you going to skip it or is it going to be a connection close error? Because if it's going to be a connection close error at that point, then that means you need to, you already know how to parse every type of control message you will ever receive. And therefore the length is not that helpful. But if you're gonna skip it, it's quite helpful. I mean, I've, I've assumed that it was like a, a session error. Um, and that's why we have set of parameters, right? To negotiate stuff like this. One of the reasons we have set of parameters. Nope. 
you're muted, Mo. Ian, were you thinking of optional messages that we may define later that you are not required to implement? Or are you thinking of version negotiation? There's a version mismatch or something. I was more thinking, um, I think it's like HTTP2 style optional messages where like, if you don't know what it is, you just like skip over it and move on with your life. Um, and I'm not saying it's a good idea or a bad idea. I'm not trying to make a valid judgment. I'm just trying to figure out like, that is a reason to add a link is to allow you to easily skip over it. If you know how to parse everything the moment you see the type, then there's kind of no point in the length. I think the thing that could drive us in that direction is if we start differentiating endpoints and relays and the messages they receive and send more clearly. And I know we're, we keep saying that the relay to relay protocol is out of scope, but if relays end up wanting to use mock for the relay to relay protocol, you know, it may make sense to have different control messages for those, uh, like inner relay messages. And it may make sense to have different messages, control messages for some publishers and subscribers and leaf relays too. So that would make some of the messages optional. Yep. So in other words, you think it's reasonable, just like HTTP headers, that some relays would not understand the meaning of a given header like passing through it. Sure. Victor, good work. Uh, I mean, I think just because if we require all messages to be known doesn't mean that we should remove or omit the length. Uh, I am in generally enthusiastic about having length because this means that like if I know that all of my control messages have to be limited to something like 16 kilobytes and I will reject anything smaller than that, uh, sorry, bigger than that, that I can just read the length and either reject it or allocate a buffer of exactly that size for that message. Uh, and in general, uh, I think most protocols do have length. The only protocol I know that does not have length is Quick, and Quick is a bad example because Quick has a fixed datagram size, so you know exactly how big everything is. And Quick also does not require you to do that thing where you receive half of Quick Frame and then receive the second half of Quick Frame later. Um, would anyone object to us adding a header, a length for control messages now, and then we can discuss whether we need more lengths in other messages later? Oh, Victor. Oh, uh, it's not the object. I forgot to mention to other things. So for data headers, there is a, a bit of a thing where we have two kinds of headers. One is like at the front of uh, the peep and one is in between the like every object. And yeah. that's also kind of a header. Uh, so the uh, I'm not sure if the PR adds like the draft for the VR added to both of those, but uh, uh, so that, that would kind of make those lens uh, add up. Just one of the reasons I was not a fan of this. Uh, but uh, I do not object to the proposal. Victor, one clarification question on that one. You're saying that you're not a fan of adding the header prefix or length to both the the starter header and the anonymous header that goes, or you're saying that you're okay with on the starter one, but not okay with the anonymous objects? Uh, I'm. Uh, what I'm not okay is adding to one, but not the other. Uh, okay. I'm. Uh, I'm mildly opposed to just adding to either of them because uh, I think it's a bit of a wasteful. And if you transmit audio, that would be like a reasonable overhead for the stream. So, uh, cool. Thank you. Ian, you're muted. 
I apologize. I was saying, um, I think we can move forward with the the like slightly smaller changes just to control messages and then continue discussing on other things. But uh, no, go for it. Um, yeah, just to answer Victor, I think it is important to make sure that we keep low bandwidth cases in mind like audio. But like Alan mentioned in one of the comments, uh, if we expected to use datagram, this wouldn't apply to datagrams because you'd have the entire datagram already in memory. So um, if you're doing audio over streams, you're already paying penalties. Uh, so if you're okay with you know stream IDs and everything else and another byte um, doesn't seem like too much tax for stream headers. And, and one, one clarification question on that move is that sorry to cut the line here. Uh, even in the datagram, you can have you can pack multiple objects if they fit, right? Like in the, if you're supporting the red kind of use case, you have the current audio and the previous audio, you can still fit in datagram. So, but this is not, this uh, is not uh, object framing. This is just gravy for object header parsing, right? You can still right. frame the objects, in, in mm -hmm. uh, no problem. You can find the boundary, right? Uh, the frames, no problem. I think it does not require for datagram, like Alan said. That's that was my point. Um, cool. Come on. I mean, I, I I guess I would like to, you know, I haven't gone and done the analysis to see what this actually does to the bandwidth of of a, a very low bit rate audio, but that is of concern for me, and I sort of like I, that's that's where I was like, I'm totally fine with control messages, um, but I I I did think it was worth holding off a bit on low bit rate audio messages, whether it was in streams or datagrams, um, just to sort of carefully do that analysis and see if it matters or not um, when we when all the dust settles. I mean, I think it's important for competitive aspect on this draft to be able to say we're less overhead than RTP. Like, like that's one of the things I want to walk out of here with. Um, and that's a sort of arbitrary fine line, but it'd be interesting, but we're really close to it right now. <laughs> cool, good point. Um, to go back to the question of skipping messages, if you get something you do not understand, do you close the connection or do you skip it? Because I think we should define that in this change now that we can skip things. I mean, I, I would say in general, um, you know, it's a little dangerous to like send a message and not know what's going to happen at the end at the at the at the receiver. Um, right. The only case I can see is the one that Mo raised, where if we want like end to end and we'll queue messages that are supposed to be ignored by relays. But that that seems like a new thing to me that we've not really discussed before. Okay. So, uh, just just to clarify that I I uh, didn't mean Martin that that we would define new end to end messages. I meant that the current protocol defines a bunch of stuff, but some things would only apply for the publisher to leaf relay. Some things only apply from leaf relay back to publisher. Some things will only apply from subscriber to leaf relay and from leaf relay to subscriber. We munch all those things together into one unified control message space. If we and we add more messages, if we start separating out those spaces conceptually, some endpoints may not implement that. If I'm just a publisher, I don't implement the other stuff. If I'm a if I'm a relay, I don't implement any of the stuff that the publishers and subscribers end end subscriber and original publisher uh, Im implement. So that's what I well, meant. Well, okay. Um, that's. I mean, we already have messages that apply only to publishers and subscribers, right? Like, uh, if your role is subscriber, you can't send an announced message, for instance. So, like, I mean, I don't think it's too much to ask for someone to implement like a universal MOQ parser that, like, at least allows you to. Uh, um, or, or like, or actually, isn't it? I mean, if that's the case, isn't it an error for you to receive that message? Um, and you generally will have to parse it and and know to throw the error and kill the kill the session because you're not supposed to get a like I say you're not supposed to get a subscribe if you're if you're a subscriber role. Um, I the current set of messages they're small enough that we could demand everybody implements all of them. But if the list grows and if future versions of mock grow, you know, you wouldn't want that space to be. Uh, unclear about who's sending, who, who's allowed to send what, and every implementation has a full implementation of every message. 
Well, I mean, again, I, I think our uh, like I, I get that there could be a huge range of like let's say we'd like a thousand different messages, for some like three hundred for each role. Um, like you, you, sh you should not be receiving those messages. Like the sender should not be sending them. So, like it, 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 it like if if you cause like a huge, like I mean, our, our rules up to now has been if you get something you're not supposed to get, you should kill the session. If we want to, if we want to free people of the of the parsing expense of that and like not make them do that, you still like if you send a message you shouldn't send and you cause their parser to completely malfunction. That's kind of on you. Like you should not send messages that the receiver cannot process. We can already tell that just by the type, which would come before the length anyway, right? So the length wouldn't have any bearing on that behavior. Right. Fair enough. Yeah, that's also true. I agree, Mo. And so I guess I go back to my previous question about if we know the type and we're not supposed to send messages that are skippable. I'm a, a bit less sure what the motivation for this change is, but I, well, I mean, it's it's like I said, it's CPU versus wire efficiency, right? So you're just you're making it. You don't you don't have to trial decode headers. Um, like I, like for instance, our I mean, I'm sure other people do something similar, but our parser currently, you know, you get some bytes, you start parsing. If you run out of you run out of buffer before you you completed all the all the control message data, like you just throw it back into your you just say oops and you just stop you just hold and you know so like conceivable like I have a test where I feed one byte at a time into the parser and make sure it works fine and it does work fine uh, like that's sort of see, that's sort of computationally expensive whether that's a real like problem for the DDoS or not I I, I can't say although I'm skeptical. Um, and but the cost of doing something like this is just to attack another byte or so onto the, you know, every message, which is, again, not the end of the world, but um, my instincts are very much against it. Uh, so I think I'm I'm leaning towards keeping ahead logic just just because like a control message that it uh, both the parties uh, understand they expect a response. For the control message that one party sends, the other party does not understand. You should not invoke a response because that's a DOS vector. Um, we, uh, having having length would let you skip ahead and not even bother about how to react to that one. It's less computationally intensive on the server side, and we should go with that. And the, having length would help um, in those kind of scenarios. Okay. Um. So I think at this moment I'm leaning towards we're adding a link to the control messages. If you receive a control message you do not understand, you are still closing the session with an error, just like we are today. And um, yeah, we'll see how that plays out. I mean, I think that's totally sensible. I just yeah, cool. Okay, thank you. Um, so, us, do you need help with fixing that up in a timely manner? I don't know what your schedule is like today. Uh, I do. I can do a commit on this one to remove the changes from the the data side of the things. Um, maybe I might need you to do another commit on your last pass to fix the oh. error part of it. If that helps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'm happy to okay. do that. That sounds perfect. Cool. Okay. Sounds good. Thank perfect. you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I sent Martin something. I don't know if Martin, did you want me to present that? Is that helpful or? Uh, I'm sorry. I've been, I've been looking at my chat. Um. Um, didn't Alan email that already? I think the so. The yeah. requirements document. Oh, that's a problem statement. Yep. So, uh, I mean, I, I think we already talked about it a little bit. If, if you don't think, I mean, we have 10 minutes. If you don't think there's a different issue that, um, we can close in the next 10 minutes, then yeah, we could talk about fetch, but I think fetch is lower priority at this point. People know that they should go read the document and comment on the problem right. statement. I, there are no other PRs that I think are liable at this moment. Okay. Yeah, let's I'm, talk about that then. Yeah. Um, so but, but, let me find it. Or actually, actually, why don't you, do you mind presenting, Martin? No. Okay. So Alan kindly tried to gather various you know issues that we already have outstanding um, to attempt to create a fetch problem statement. And I wanted to put it in front of all of you to see if this kind of matches up with 
what you're thinking. Um, you know, obviously you don't have to agree with every single thing said here, but uh, the goal is to come up with a reasonable summary so we know where we're heading. And we know what the success criteria are. So. So, you know, some of these look like solutions, not requirements. And let's talk about number two for a second. Like, what's the, I mean, is there a problem? <laughs> I mean, relays don't need to know if there's gaps or not. I'm. <laughs> that's a good point um well i mean it can't determine if their cache is complete i was going to say i think that's a cacheability problem uh but i agree that that issue no, but, but regard let, let's just say let, let's say let's say you know how that i mean they don't need to do that they like if there's gaps in a the cache they request upstream every solution has always been that right uh, so right so so if, so yeah. if like if if four has been omitted yeah for whatever reason, with no with no object status thingy, so uh, like I'm gonna go do a, I'm gonna go subscribe to that specific object, and it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> then you get back, it doesn't exist, and you send down, it doesn't exist. I mean, like I'm I'm I remain un unclear on what the problem anyone's talking about here. Well, that just seems way wordier than just sending a object status message. Ah. Uh, and, and isn't that deeply into implement? I, I mean, I didn't say that the way you say it doesn't exist is an um, object status message is fine, whatever. I don't care. I'm not discussing the solution. I'm trying to figure out what, what the problem is. I don't I don't get it. <laughs> I, I think the challenge right now is today there's no text about kind of how to use object status, when you should, must, et cetera, use it. And so it's a bit unclear kind of as a cache and other things like what to do with this information, which admittedly may not be a fetch problem at all. So I, I, yeah. I, I, well, like, I, so I don't really agree with point two as a problem statement. Like, and like point three, again, like I don't think this is true. Like you read the draft, like this is what the expire and TTL discussion or whatever we call it, the expire thing is completely about is when the relay drops stuff out of the cache. And we have a, I, I, again, I don't understand why this isn't a problem, you know, this first of all isn't a problem statement, and then second of all is not true. Um. I tend to agree with you as an individual on three that I'm like I think it's pretty clear what should be dropped, but um, maybe the draft isn't clear enough. I imagine there's some underlying on like I imagine like if somebody's like oh no there's the, I have a like, I imagine somebody could state a problem here. I'm not I'm sure the draft's less than perfect, but I I just don't quite know what it is. <laughs> And so maybe this doc is not the right starting point, but like it would be very helpful to have like a motivation doc for like the fetch stuff. No, go for it. I think what's confusing people is we've never talked about the dynamics of a relay. Uh, so there's no verbiage anywhere that says, you know, how does the relay actually see that something is live or that it's missing something or that it's it's we don't define what the behavior of the relay is uh for for whether or not something is you know uh, 10 milliseconds behind 200 milliseconds behind 500 milliseconds behind. we don't describe how those different objects coming in would route differently across the relay or whether they all route the same and fetch is going to fall into the same trap now you have the live subscribes assuming that we separate fetch and subscribe into live and not live you have the live subscribes, and then you also have these, you know, previous non-live fetches. You're gonna have this exact same dynamics issue at the relay. What what is the what's the behavior of a relay when it tries to do an upstream fetch? Does it have to mark that this that this is this object is pending fetch or something like that? Uh, um, and it shouldn't. It should also aggregate the fetches and not and, and not not upstream request uh, the same object twice even if it got, you know, five other fetches that overlapped. So I think the dynamics of the relay um, fetching and, and subscribing and forwarding have never been dealt with. We probably need to deal with them. And it may involve time dynamics too. We may have to specify some kinds of timeouts or something, not just the TTL specified by the user, but some things in the protocol itself built into the protocol. 
that make sense for forwarders. Thanks, Mo. Um, so us, do you want to go there? Um, yeah, um, I, I think this, this is more about dealing with, Fetch has to answer questions. Either it can answer from the cache or it can go to the origin, origin the source of truth to find the answer. And, and that's where we, we are trying to define if a realized ambiguity of something being either not produced or produced but dropped or will never was ever be part of the grouping mechanism or whatever it is. Today, there's no way to define what should the relay behavior and how should we go to the source of truth or look from the cache and combine those two things and provide an answer. There's, there's a resolution to something that's unaware of that point in time. Um, which is which is which may be way behind you know live edge or where it is and, and that's something subscribe cannot solve today that's one of the problems why fetch discussions came in mock interim as well because you don't want for every subscribe to go find an answer and come then it's no no, no longer live you're just in catch up mode uh, that kind of separation of thinking about the past and there's a source of truth and a way for any participating entity to resolve the ambiguities is what fetch is trying to address but on subscribe side, you don't have those requirements. It's live. You get what you get. You consume or you lose it. And that kind of clearly subscribes, uh, separates, separates the why we wanted something like fetch versus something like subscribe. Why is, why is stream flow control and, and like max stream ID not back pressure? It, it's terrible back pressure. It's like very awkward at best okay right like especially how many you don't know how many groups you're going to have you don't know how many subgroups aka peeps you're going to have like so on and so forth yeah also if uh, if you have two fetches in parallel and like you're trying to back pressure on both unclear what happens and that requires stuff from the quick stack right now we need a quick stack that lets me set a rate timer you know uh i want to download at one meg give me flow control credit at one meg <laughs> well I, it, it's a very difficult mechanism to implement as like a high availability relay like if you have a thousand back end fetches going on at once or even a hundred like how do you possibly try to get them to all make reasonable progress without you know, starving one or the other, like, you, you know, it, it's very challenging. Uh, well, like starvation is a question of prior. Okay, we're gonna run out of time here, but starvation is a question of priority. And I mean, if the issues were going to consume resources, so like if the subscribers are overloaded, it's going, it's going to stop accepting data from the quick stack. So like the flow control is going to freeze up and make its way back as is like as like queues and caches fill up through the chain, right? Yeah, but if you have two subscriptions and one's real time and one's fetch, how do Should... you make sure that the real time one makes progress while providing back pressure for the fetch one? And think and think of the gross back pressure that you you, 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 you set you set you set priorities for you set a higher priority for the for the real time one. But it, but but if you if you if you allow any of the fetch to go, you're not only going to open your window for one packet, right? You're probably going to open for a few kilobytes, or maybe even you know hundreds of kilobytes. So you're going to always clobber the things that that you're you're always going to compete and clobber if you're doing gross flow control at at literally you know quick flow control level limits, unless you're willing to lit literally open your window only for a few bytes at a time and hit the signaling overhead of max data constantly. I mean, if you're willing to have like an infinite number of streams, then a lot of problems get solved, but I don't think most implementations are willing to do that. So, but streams are mm -hmm. very, stream limits are a very poor way to enforce flow control in general or provide back, back pressure. So. Well, it's 10 o'clock. Um, 
I encourage you to take, since Alan, of course, is not here, I encourage us to take this discussion to the list. Uh, uh, minus the, the do outs that various people have received, like I think it would discussion as much as possible before Cambridge, and maybe we can put some time into it on the 25th. Thank you, Mike English, for taking the minutes today, and uh, we will see you next week. We're back to the weekly rhythm for these, and then, of course, after that will be the hybrid. And thank you, everyone. And if um, you need my help on any PRs, please ping me on Slack. So thank you.